Right. So can we all see everything? Assumedly. Yep. Okay, cool. Right. So hello and welcome to this presentation on deep learning for animal orientation. Uh, before we get started, I think it's quickly worth mentioning that I'm not going to be delving too much into the deep learning practices just for the sake of time. I do have some bonus slides at the end um, if we do have time, but for now I'm just going to try and limit the jargon as much as possible. Uh, so yeah, without further ado. So behavioral experiments, as many of you I'm sure know, are the foundation uh, for many of the most important discoveries in neuroscience. Uh, and these experiments often require some form of specialized instrumentation to allow experimenters to gather data quickly. Uh, there are numerous examples of papers um, that describe interesting methods for behavioral data collection, uh, but frequently lead, they lead to drastic alterations in the natural conditions. So if you were to design a perfect tool uh, to collect behavioral data, you'd want it to be automatic, robust, and non-invasive. And this project aimed to develop such a tool. So in the behavioral experiment that this tool would be used for, uh, a dragonfly would be affixed to a perch with its head free to move. Uh, it would be watching a screen in front of it, and its behavior response to visual stimuli would be recorded. A tiny endoscope camera would capture images of the head whilst minimally obstructing uh, the visual stimuli. So the goal of this project was to develop an algorithm uh, that could recognize the orientation of the head of the dragonfly using a single image from this single camera. And the orientation needs to be detected across all rotational degrees of freedom which means like this way, that way, and that way. If you can see my head, I assume you can. Um, so this problem bears a lot of similarity to a depth perception problem in that you're trying to, trying to infer 3D information from an image. And depth perception in computer vision is frequently solved by something called stereopsis, which is basically using multiple cameras. But obviously that wasn't possible here because we're trying to minimally obstruct that visual stimuli, right? Um, and the most successful solutions to this kind of monocular depth perception problem, problem are deep learning models. Um, so that's what I did. <laughs> um, so two different algorithms were developed, both of which were deep learning based. Um, the first used a markerless pose recognition uh, plugin for Python called Deep LabCut. I'm going to refer to that as DLC from here on out. So DLC allows the user to train a specialized convolutional neural network that can detect locations of specific features of a specimen given an image. So basically, you tell it what body parts to look for, and it will pick them out from an image. Uh, so the idea was that if you could compute the local distances between the features of the head, could you then use that to determine the orientation? So again, if you imagine a set of markers on my face, if I'm then turning my head to this direction, from your perspective, the distance between those markers should change. So that was the idea behind this first pipeline. Um, so the second pipeline, and just use a CNN and a coded from scratch, uh, and that would directly map the images to the orientations. So there's no need for like a DLC middleman here. It's just one, it's end to end in that regard. Um, so both of these pipelines have their own advantages. Uh, for the DLC approach, it's good because we know exactly what information is being used to encode that orientation, um, but it's only one monocular queue. So there's only one sort of uh, set of information that we're encoding there. Um, now the CNN pipeline can encode multiple monocular queues but we don't know exactly what those monocular cues are. So it's a common sort of theme in deep learning is it's usually like a black box approach. So we can train the algorithm, we can tell it you know, what the architecture looks like inside of the black box, but fundamentally we don't know really what it's doing to calculate its output. And that can cause a lot of issues with things like troubleshooting. Um, so those are the sort of advantages and, and the cons of both. But before I go into any more depth as to each of the pipelines, we need to, need to talk about training data. So both of these approaches were supervised learning based, and that means they need labeled data to learn. Now, what I mean by labeled data is I need images of, dragon, of a dragonfly's head with associated labels as to exactly where that dragonfly is looking in each of those images. So then the question is, how do I quickly and accurately gather this kind of data? Uh, one idea was to use 3D rendered images uh, and manipulate the head of the dragonfly in like a virtual environment. Um, but with this idea, you almost definitely run into something called covariate shift. So when you're training a supervised learning algorithm, it's important that the training data be sampled from the same distribution as the input data that the trained algorithm should respect, expect to receive, uh, which means I need real images of real dragonflies. Um, so I need to manipulate the head of a real dragonfly, basically. So the answer came in something called a spherical parallel manipulator, which I'm just going to call Mary. Um, so Mary is actually named after Mary Shelley, who's the author of Frankenstein. Uh, because effectively she was going to be used to reanimate the corpse of a dead dragonfly. Um, so Mary allows for manipulation across all three degree, rotational degrees of freedom. 
and she has an end effector that has a fixed center of rotation. So the disc here is the end effector. Hang on, I think I can get a little laser pointer up. So the disc here is the end effector, and the center of rotation was designed to lie in the center of this disc. So you can kind of see all of these sort of axes here are revolute, um, and they all sort of, uh, all the axes of them uh, coincide at that sort of center of rotation at the center of the disc. Um, and at this point, there's only translation, there's no, there's, uh, there's only rotation, sorry, there's no translation whatsoever. So the idea would be is if I can put the head of the dragonfly in there and then I can rigidly attach it to that disc, uh, put a camera above it, I can take loads of images of a dragonfly's head at different orientations. Um, so that's what it did. I did. I 3D printed it and you can see that image on the right uh, and then gathered a couple thousand images of, of the dragonfly's head. Right, so, and here's a little... <laughs> Little time lapse of some of the images, which is a bit creepy, as I'm sure you'll agree. I'll skip that. Cool. So, onto the pipelines a bit more. So, the DLC pipeline consisted of two separate neural networks. Uh, so, the first one was the DLC network, and the second one was just a, a, an ANN, so an artificial neural network that I coded from hand again. Um, so, the DLC network was trained to locate markers of the dragonfly's head, and you can see some of the images there on the right of its predictions. Now, the positional data of these markers was then, was then used to compute uh, a feature vector of Euclidean distances between the markers. So the idea of using Euclidean distances, like a relative distance, was that it encodes translational invariance. So if I just fed in the raw positions of each of those markers, translation of the head around the like, field of vision of the camera would totally mess up the transfer function of the, of the algorithm. Um, so then a second feature vector was also computed and that corresponded to DLC, the DLC network's confidence as to the presence of each of those markers. So you can see in the bottom image there, uh, one of the markers is occluded. And this is really important information because DLC doesn't output um, when that marker is occluded in terms of positional data. So in that image somewhere, it has actually made a, position, uh, a prediction as to the position of that marker. It's just like in this image, it's below a threshold, so it's not being displayed. So I need some information as to whether or not a marker is occluded or not. Uh, for my sort of next step. So the two feature vectors were then fed into a multi-input artificial neural network, which then mapped uh, to a nine neuron output. So it basically learned to transfer the features into components of a right-handed coordinate system, and that would be used to determine the head orientation. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So the CNN pipeline, uh, by contrast, was used to directly map the images to the orientations. Uh, so the image here shows the architecture of the CNN, and it essentially evolves the RGB image into a vector, which is then mapped in a similar way to a nine neuron output, as with the DLC pipeline. And this is essentially what a CNN does. It takes an input tensor or an input array. Uh, in this case, it's the image here, uh, which is on the left side there. And then they have these sort of convolutional layers, which you can see along here, right? Um, and then they kind of transform it into an optimized encoding uh, for whatever the task it is that you're, that you're looking for. And then you have this sort of fully connected layer here, which then maps that encoding to the output. So that's the general idea behind a, a CNN. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but, but yeah, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, so this figure shows the histograms for the labels and predictions for both pipelines on unseen images. So images not used to train the network. Um, so each histogram is for one of the components of, a coordinate, of the coordinate system. And um, just to give you an idea as to what each of these mean, if the dragonfly was looking straight at the camera, which is like the datum position, uh, then all the values on the diagonals of these, uh, so x1, y2, and z3, they'd all be ones, and the rest would be zeros. So that should hopefully give you a bit of an idea as to, as to how this was laid out. Um, so you can see the labels are in blue, uh, the CNN predictions are in green, and the not so good DLC predictions are in red. Um, so from these results, you can see that the DLC pipeline pretty much learned to predict a constant output. Of, of the average of the distributions. And it does that independent of what image it's, it's been given. So it's, it's pretty useless. Um, the CNN pipeline on the other hand uh, shows some pretty promising performance in that it sort of inferred a lot of that distribution structure. Um, so hopefully that would have worked well. So this slide shows a couple example images of the test set and the labels uh, and the corresponding predictions for the DLC pipeline. Um, so you can see the images on the left show the coordinate systems overlaid on top of the image used as input. So I'll take my time on this. So the blue one, uh, the red one and the green one represent the ground truth axes. So they're the labels. 
And then you have the magenta, the cyan, and the yellow, which are the corresponding predictions. So the blue one should align with the pin, if it's correct. And the red one should be where the dragonfly is looking, right? So on the right side, you can also see sort of like a different um, viewing angle, basically, of this, of this coordinate system. And there's also sort of some black arrows there, uh, and they detect, dictate this sort of data in position. And what you can see from both of these predictions is they're pretty much the same for both, and they pretty much also both coincide exactly with that data in position. And this kind of makes sense because all of the training data was symmetrical in terms of orientations about that datum. So if we're talking about it trying to minimize the cost across that training set, the optimal position that it should take is in the middle of that, right? Uh, if it's symmetrically collected, which it was. Um, so that kind of makes sense. But again, it doesn't, doesn't sort of change the fact that this is a pretty useless pipeline. Um, so by contrast, fortunately, the CNN pipeline uh, made some pretty, pretty good predictions. Um, so you can see basically predictions almost, almost perfectly align with those labels. Uh, so that's promising. Uh, however, as I mentioned, we don't actually know, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't actually know what the CNN is using to encode that information. For example, is it using features of the mounting pin uh, in order to, to, to you know, uh, determine that prediction? Um, and this is a question of generalization. Uh, so the way to sort of test for this is to gather more test data. Uh, so that's what I did. So this is a new test set, and you can see there's no mounting pin there. Uh, so it's gathered in a very similar manner, but there's no mounting pin. It's a different specimen, so the morphology is, if I sort of compare to the previous one, it's quite different. Um, and without a doubt, uh, it's less accurate than the previous data set, uh, just by eye. Um, but that's not really to be unexpected, uh, given the fact that the training data consisted of just one specimen, and that was the same specimen used in that previous test set. Um, however, despite the inaccuracy, I think it's fair to say that there's definitely some evidence of generalization here. Um, and that emphasizes the robustness of the pipeline, given the fact there is no mounting pin and the morphology is different. And also there's, there's quite a lot of background clutter there in terms of uh, the legs are sort of uh, obstructing a bit of the, a bit of the frame. So yeah, that was, that was good. So how could the DLC pipeline be improved? Um, so the failure of the DLC pipeline is most likely because rotation about the magenta axis, so the z-axis, so where it's looking, um, requires information regarding distances between the markers and some fixed marker, like not affixed to the heads, some global reference. So it's possible that depth information was being encoded by that sort of variable Euclidean distance feature vector, um, but the network couldn't use the information to determine the orientation without some sort of global reference. Um, so this is something that could be considered in future work. And essentially, all you need to do is, is pop some markers in the corners of the image, for example. But then you, you do start to run into some issues with like translation and variance, which I mentioned earlier. So you can kind of see that there's some issues with this pipeline that are quite fundamental to its core um, that may not be solved. Another example of that is the DLC network, which is used to generate the feature vectors in the first place. It requires manual data, manually labeled data. So that's, that's me going in there and, and telling it to pick out specific features of the dragonfly's head. And all that does is introduce human variability and human area. Um, and given that the distance or the variable distance between these markers used to encode the orientation is probably going to be quite small, it's likely that the noise that I introduced by, by doing it myself corrupts that data entirely. Um, so that's another fundamental issue with this. Uh, and finally, uh, we noticed on those, previous, on those previous slides to do with the different test sets, the morphology is, is quite different across specimens, not massively so, but different enough that a small distance between sort of local features uh, would be noticeable. Um, hence, that kind of means that if you were to recognize a new specimen, you'd have to train it on that specimen. And if you had to train it on that specimen, you first have to kill that specimen. And obviously, that's, that's pretty useless for a behavioral experiment. Um, so, so that's that. And then the CNN pipeline. So it showed better performance, uh, but there's still room for improvement. Um, the error in the prediction of the CNN, pipe, in the CNN pipeline uh, was approximately plus or minus two degrees. And that pretty much matches the inaccuracy of, of Mary. And that's due to the poor tolerances of the 3D printing techniques used. So they used uh, fused deposition modeling, so FD, FDM. Um, so if you use like a better 3D printing technique, like SLS, for example, um, the results may well have been imp improved just to do with better tolerances of that. Um, another issue was that there was no fixed protocol to mount the head. Uh, and this wasn't an issue with the performance because the same specimen was used to gather all the training data. Uh, so there was no sort of variability in that mounting procedure. Um, but 
if you wanted it to generate, if you wanted the network to generate stuff as specimens, you'd need training data on other specimens. So you'd probably need some mounting procedure. And this could be some form of device, uh, similar to something that Sam used uh, to mount his reflective markers on his projects. Uh, so you could 3D print something that could do that pretty easily, I imagine. And that's it. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, like I say, I've got some bonus slides at the end. If you want a bit of an introduction to deep learning, or I could explain the kinematic algorithm that Mary used, or some of the control system stuff that Mary used. Not that it's very complicated, but yeah. So cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. OK, let's uh, take questions. Um, anyone? Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Oh, hey. So you have a good question, uh, good presentation, by the way. Um, yes, good stuff. So when you have your uh, neural network, you said that the output mm -hmm. was nine. Uh, yeah. Nine values at the end, yeah. essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that just uh, what? So what, what would that, what would that be? Just uh, so that's that's three vectors of a right-handed uh, okay. orthogonal coordinate system. So uh -huh. each of them have three okay. components. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I map to yeah. So when you were talking about your sort of second set of data that you were mm -hmm. essentially getting without the um, mounting pin, right? Yeah, but there's there's no labels associated with that data whatsoever. That's just me pushing around with my finger. The head of the okay, yeah. Um, uh, so, so that's visual expression, yeah. Uh, so that's just like sort of you visually confirming whether or not it lines up with the dragonfly. But, yeah. So you haven't actually trained on that data at all? No, so the, these images are, are completely new. Um, so the only images okay. that we're trained on are basically that same, that's those images there you uh -huh. see in that, that, yeah. that sort of slide. Um, and then this was just like, you know, like a, a, a test to see if it would generalize. I didn't actually expect it to do so well. Um, okay. but I mean, that's understandable, I suppose. 100%, uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you had a mounting pin that was more transparent, I don't know what mounting pin you were using. I think you yeah. were using, it's like a steel rod, right? Yeah, it was just an insect pin. Yeah. Yes. Um, could you use something like a glass capillary tube or maybe an even thinner metal mounting pin to be able to sort of get around this problem? Because yeah, this is like good. a fairly big problem, I suppose, for if I it were is, to chuck it in. It is. Um, it is definitely an issue. Uh, there's, there's different techniques you could use. So you could maybe digitally remove it from the image. So you could sort of like paint it blue or something and then just remove those pixels okay, and then sort okay. of replace it with the background. Uh -huh. But I think the issue you'd run into in doing that is even if like your eye can't perceive that there's a sort of replacement pixel there, it's yeah, likely yeah. that the network will still pick up on like a sort of virtual edge there. Um, so yeah, I think this is this is definitely an issue uh, to do with so the I think if you gathered like a lot of data, it would be a lot better as well. So that would um, be a more problem with just like uh, your CNN versus your DLC, right? Yeah, so that's that's the benefit of the DLC pipeline, right? Is yeah. I'm extracting features that I know aren't <laughs> associated with the pin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I think it comes down to just gathering more training data, basically. I think if you gathered a bunch of training data on a bunch of specimens, I, I don't think this would be such an issue. Um, okay. there's, there's, there's ways around uh, generalization, and they're called sort of regularization. Um, and basically, you punish the network for being too specific. Um, yep. So you, you, punish, you have a cost function associated with, with how the network determines its optimization. Um, and then you can add an extra term onto that which basically punishes it for, for fitting to the noise of the data, which in this case would be would be the pin. So you yeah. basically have to tweak around and mess around with this sort of this hyperparameter. And then you'd hopefully end up with something that, that was that was generalized. Um, but I think the issue here in terms of it not fitting so well to the um, to this dragonfly specimen is more to do with the fact that like I say it was it was just trained on, on a single specimen with like one particular lighting condition. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. um, obviously, the lighting condition will be fairly consistent throughout yeah. my experiment. But um, one final question I have is, mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, this is not really to do with the presentation itself, right? But I have been looking at your rig, and you have yeah. sort of like had a lot of trouble with the rig that you were building yeah. and how <laughs> getting it to work and working with the torrents. Do you have any sort of... Uh, I haven't read your thesis, I suppose, mm. so maybe it's included in there. Have, do you have like a solid plan as to the exact changes you would make to your rig to make it more robust? 
Um, so as I mentioned, I think for the most part, uh, just a better three D printing technique would help a lot. Um, so I've seen. So the paper that this sort of manipulator is stolen from uh, used SLS printing to three D print yeah. theirs, and they sort of have videos of theirs, and it's a lot smoother in terms of its motion than mine was. Okay. Um, but you but had the issues problem like with the motor, right? Sorry. The motor itself had a lot of backlash. Uh, yeah, th those are issues with the stepper motors for sure. Just to think on the gearing ratio inside of them. I think the gears mm. inside the stepper motor actually had backlash themselves. Mm. Um, the other, there's, uh, there's other issues with it, like fatigue and stuff. So you're using like PLAX or something like that. Um, and after a while, I found that that sort of warped a lot. And I said the biggest issue with it is sort of the translation of the head, right? Um, so there is a fixed center of rotation and it is sort of the coincident point of all those axes. But if those axes yeah. are shifting around and if you haven't put the head in that perfect location, then it's just going to move around the frame. So I had a lot of issues with calibration um, in terms of making sure that it wasn't sort of just, just dipping out of the frame. You can see from those sort of those images here of the time lapse, I got it, I got it quite well. So it wasn't yeah, moving yeah. around too much, but that was, that was quite fun <laughs> to pull that off. Um, because I tried it again. Oh, I see, like, that's terrifying to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is horrifying. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's creepy for sure. But you know, it's uh, yeah. it's an efficient way to gather data for sure. Oh, cool. Thanks. That's all for me. Yeah, cool. Actually, I just pick up something. So the output you said uh, nine um, nine outputs. For, mm. So the, those are basically three unit vector. Yeah. The, okay. But can you just put out six instead? Because I mean, if they're all orthogonal in theory. For sure. Yeah, you definitely can. So, so one of my ideas was, well, first of all, I feel like if you can give it more information as to what the correct answer is, then you're sort of you, you're helping it there. Uh, but okay. there's kind of no real relationship. I mean, I mean, there is a relationship between those angles, uh, mm -hmm. in between those mm -hmm. outputs, based on the fact yeah. that it's all interconnected. That's sort of how a, a neural network work, <laughs> works, right? It's all sort of interconnected yeah. logistic yeah. units. So there is definitely a relationship. So I feel like the more information you can give it as to what the correct answer is, the better. My mm -hmm. other idea was that you could incorporate the sort of orthogonalization of those vectors that's inherent to all, to all of them, right? Oh, I see. Um, and you could incorporate that into the loss function. And that could yes. also aid with that sort of, you know, you're, you're giving it more of the correct answer. Right, so right. if we look on those vectors, they, they aren't actually fully normalized. Um, mm. So they kind of look like they match up. Well, this one's probably better. They kind of look like they're matched up, but then they're, they're not actually unit vectors. Um, mm. so that's kind of why I'm talking about, you know, uh, taking advantage of, of some of the inherent um, inherent properties of these of this this coordinate system that we have. Um, oh, right. Definitely improvements that can be made in that regard as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you can build in that to your cost function. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Um, any other questions? Um, if not, I'll thank Matt and I'll move on to the last presentation.